Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to begin by just making a few introductory remarks, and then I'm, I'm sure folks will drop in as we um, as we proceed here. But I want to welcome those of you who can make it tonight. I'm excited about our presentation. But um, if I don't know if all of you follow the news as closely as I do with Haiti, but uh, the, the Kenyan police force has arrived. Uh, 400 police officers arrived on Tuesday, and I understand I was just on the phone with Domo, our staff person, and he's pretty sure that another plane came in today. Um, so perhaps they doubled their size. The expected number of troops or police officers from Kenya is about 1,000. They're expecting mm -hmm. another 1,000 from various other countries, not including the United States. The United States has provided all the logistical support. They've been flying in plane after plane after plane of all kinds of materials and support. So we're basically setting up the camp that'll be used for the, for housing all the police officers um, staged at the airport, Port-au-Prince. The Port-au-Prince airport is, is, has been back open for the last few weeks. Uh, a lot of planes flying in and out as I understand it. So um, I mean, I talked to Domo just earlier today and from Port-au-Prince and um, he said that in the last two weeks, things have really calmed down. Now, a lot of the uh, the gang members have, in anticipation of the police force arriving, have have kind of taken to the to the hills, if you will, and many have left the country. Some have crossed the borders, um, things like that. So, um, I don't know if that's a hopeful or helpful sign, but uh, the, uh, the 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 force that's there is considered a peacekeeping force. So, I hope you all join me in praying that it is that exactly that it's a peaceful uh, transition. The ultimate goal of the peacekeeping force is actually uh, it's not really a catch and kill mission, but rather it is a mission to provide enough security that Haiti can hold a free election. And um, if that can happen, there'll certainly be a, a huge gain for the country. Um, so let's all continue to pray, obviously, for, for a peaceful transition here. Um, Mary, I see that you've joined us. And Mary, you're just in time. All right. If you'll unmute yourself and begin us with a, a prayer, we will be off and running, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> Dear Lord, well, we gather with hearts full of love. A, um, we have a Zoom call in Haiti or to the Haiti group. Okay, Mary. I, I, I muted her. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, Dear Lord, we gather with hearts full of love to do your will and to be of help to the people of Haiti and Central America. Thank you for this opportunity to be together, to learn about the Haiti Family Care Network, to get firsthand information from Amanda, and to share knowledge with one another. Help us to listen intently, to find something we can apply twin parish relationship. And finally, wherever we are in our twin parish relationship, fill us with the positive attitude of your love and faith that you will see us through any difficulties that may arise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate that. So I'm really excited to introduce Amanda. Amanda Cox and I just met, oh gosh, it's only been a couple of months ago. And the, um, she's the coordinator of the Haiti Family uh, Care Network. And she'll tell you about what that is and obviously the purpose and some of their, their goals and perhaps ways that we can be engaged in the work that we do in Haiti. Um, but they they hosted a conference in Nashville, Tennessee, just uh, two, I believe, was it two weeks ago, Amanda? And um, I was able to attend, and there were providers of all kinds of different, really children and family services, a lot of educational organizations working in Haiti. So it was a great opportunity to kind of to talk about collaborating and different things that we're doing, different ways that we can work together. And so it was a really, really great time spent, and I learned an awful lot. And I said, boy, what, what Amanda's sharing and all the other presenters sharing, our network really needs to hear this because it's, it's really a, a pretty profound shift in movement that's happening in the country. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of good that we, uh, we can do as we, as we learn more. So I'm gonna kick it off to Amanda. Amanda, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us. Amanda's joining us from kind of the Colorado area. She's two hours behind us, but uh, we're so glad that she could make it, Amanda. That's right, two hours behind you. So still early my time. I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen with the caveat that I am not technologically inclined. And so if there are any problems, um, you might want to just uh, shout out and let me know. Um, 
All right. So David, you said that you gave me uh, the ability to share screen yeah. and it is not letting me. <laughs> uh, let me check that again. But if you want to, um, you could pull up my slides if you want to, that I sent to you. And I'm happy to just follow my own slides from my phone and from the screen. That's fine too. It's kind of a chronic problem trying to share screen on Zoom. I've had better luck on Google Meet. There you go. Right. Awesome. Perfect. If you want to click on slideshow so it'll fill the screen if that's possible. Yeah, and I'm not seeing the uh the option the, the functions that I usually see because yeah. Um, that's all right. I think we're all right. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just scan through my hopefully you can see that well enough. But try double clicking on that one, just see if it opens it up fully. It did not. Nothing. All right. Yeah, I don't have any kind of a menu at the top, so I'm not sure. Not a problem. Uh, we can work from this. Uh, I've encountered so many problems over the years, right, with technology that there's always a backup plan. So uh, yeah. thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, it's my understanding I have about 30 minutes to present. Is that about right? And then we'll ask questions. Yeah, yeah, I should have said that. Well, you know, if, you, if you've got any questions that come up, in the, go ahead and put them in the chat or save them for later. But Amanda's going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. Absolutely. Um, and I want to give the caveat that I prepared this presentation in sort of three different sections. And so the first section is a bit of an overview about what the Haiti Family Care Network is, what it does, how we came to be. The second section is a bit about the impact of care, specifically residential care on children, um, and a bit about sort of the benefits of family care. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that topic, um, this will be new. And for those of you that are already familiar, it may be just a bit of review. And then the last section is a bit more of a look at global and regional policies around family care. And so um, that might feel a bit boring, a little policy talk, but um, I'm going to give you a bunch of different uh, websites and resources where you can always read more. So it doesn't have to be too long and drawn out on the policy section. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. I'm going to introduce myself and my background. I um, am the coordinator for the Haiti Family Care Network, which began, we launched a couple of years ago, but I've been the network coordinator for almost three years this fall. Uh, prior to that, I've worked for 18 years in the international development realm, specifically around child protection. Um, and my area of specialty has always been what's called care reform. So helping governments and organizations think through what policies, what activities they need to change in order to promote family care for children, whatever that looks like in their country. There are now some global best practice around that that I'll talk about, but that's um, been my area of specialty. And I came to that after volunteering in a lot of orphanages in college and as a young adult and uh, starting what was called the Haiti, uh, sorry, starting the Faith to Action Initiative. And sort of around that time, 18 years ago, uh, everyone was starting to talk about family care and I just felt hit over the head by a lightning bolt when I started hearing about how important families are um, to children and how much more the faith community could be doing to promote that. And so this has been a culmination of a lot of um, passion and personal and professional interest. Um, and you can always reach me and I'll put my contact uh, inbox and email address at the end of the presentation. So you can always connect for more information. All right, so this is a great first start uh, slide to start on. The Haiti Family Care Network, our vision is that all Haitian children are given the opportunity to thrive in families. Just very simply that, that everyone has that opportunity no matter where they're at now. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, and then our mission is that we are an educational catalyst and an advocate for that shift in Haiti. It really takes somebody advocating and somebody pushing for that shift to make change happen in just about any country. Go to the next slide. Um, we decided when we came together, uh, the leadership council of the network, to create a network model that is free and open to everyone. And so why a network model? The idea behind networks, right, are that uh, they improve collaboration, that they are right now, the network is free to everybody. There is no membership. There is no vetting. There are no fees. Anyone can access any of our messaging, any of our documents, any of our resources, any of our opportunities. Um, we found it very important about three years ago that um, a group come together and be a, 
a collective place for resources about family care to exist, um, especially specific to Haiti. A lot of our leadership were getting questions about how do we do this? How do we reunify a child from an orphanage with a family? Um, where can we find a child protection policy? Um, what, why are, how does education, you know, support families? Should we offer scholarships? Um, how might feeding support families? And so our leaders are organizations in Haiti that have been there for a long time and have a long-term commitment to Haiti. And um, we decided as a group that it would be more efficient for all those questions to come through one channel. And so that is the leadership council of the Haiti Family Care Network. And each of our leaders can, you can go to the next slide. Oh, nope, go back up to the slide right under our Y network. There you go. Each of our leadership council members um, works in a slightly different area of family care in Haiti. Many of them came to the work by opening orphanages and then over time determining that they could reach a large member of um, community members and families through a different kind of model. They're very experienced. Um, they have Haitian leadership and their American um, leaders represent their Haitian leadership and their programs on the ground within our network. And so um, if you want to go back up one more, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, the, oh, no. so these are each of them and they represent um, everything from anti-trafficking to education to, um, gosh, reunification of families, working with street children, training social workers, a lot of different things. And so um, on our website, you can absolutely click on any of them and find out a lot of information about what they do in Haiti if you want to get connected. All right, next slide. We have these values as a network that we established at the beginning. And our core value is that we really believe based on decades of research and experience around the world and our own experience in Haiti, that orphanages shouldn't be the first option for any child. That a child's um, life is long and is complex and small children turn into adults. And an orphanage is not necessarily a place that a small child should be raised into adulthood. Um, and so with that in mind, our values are that we believe every effort needs to be made to expand options um, that are available for vulnerable children and families, whether it's preservation of the family or placement into an extended family or even a foster family, that those should all be the first choices and not orphanage care as a first and last choice. Um, we also believe that reaching the goal of family care in Haiti requires we all work together and that there's no perfect models. Nobody is doing it perfect, family care or orphan care. Um, but that we can learn from each other and that also we can learn from really good practice in other parts of the world. And so we'll talk about that later. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so with that in mind, that we're all critically important to family care in Haiti, we created this puzzle that in no way represents every sector of working with children, youth, or families, but re represents a lot of them. And we see family care, that concept of ensuring that no child has to live forever in an orphanage and that every child is given the opportunity to thrive in a family as a puzzle. And these pieces need to work together. That is why the network is so um, important because we provide a space for anyone working in trafficking, anyone working in healthcare, anyone working in transitioning youth out of orphanages into adulthood, any of these people can come together um, and find better solutions, learn from one another and share their resources. That was what our conference was about a couple of weeks ago was presenting workshops on a lot of these different topics and how they intersect with family care and why they're so important, why each of these pieces has to be built up in order for a country to have adequate family care for healthy, thriving families. All right, you can go to the next slide. Uh, these are what it looks like to have activities as a network. I think some people um, have a hard time, right, envisioning what a network is besides me sitting behind this video talking to you, um, but this is what we actually do. So we uh, have it spelled care, it's easy to remember, and the C is for collaborate. So we provide opportunities like online phone calls, what we call community conversations, um, thematic groups for people to get involved in, all sorts of ways for people to collaborate and find other people in their area of interest or their regional area of Haiti to find ways to collaborate around information. Advocate. We definitely believe that Haiti needs to be higher on the list of in countries of interest in the Latin America and Caribbean region. It's often left out of donor interest. It's often left out of regional conferences around family care. And because of that, uh, you end up with people thinking nothing good is happening in Haiti, right? That it's all shut down, nothing's happening, no families exist. We want to really advocate that that is not true 
and that here are the best ways to engage still in Haiti, whether it's to donors or government or nonprofits or churches. Um, the R is for resource. We have an area of our website where we keep all of our resources organized. And as we receive more, we add them in by category and they're free to anyone to access and download. Some of them are global resources and some are very specific to Haiti. And then the E is for educate. So we offer a training every quarter online on a different topic. We have covered and we bring in expert speakers. Sometimes they're one of the leadership council organizations. Often they're not. They're people that we've identified as doing excellent work. We've covered some topics like disability care for families, uh, reunification of children. Um, I think we are going soon to produce one on health care. We had one a few months ago on trauma, and that had just a huge reaction, about 150 Haitian social workers and community workers gathered to hear a presentation in Creole about addressing trauma and mental health. And so we try to meet the needs of anyone that might work with children, youth, and families, not just targeted messaging around that type of program, but what do people actually need to be successful in their day-to-day -day work with children, youth, and families? You can go ahead. This is the part where I'm going to try to merge a little bit into what's happening in the world and what's happening in thinking around child development and the impact of um, residential or orphanage care on child development and just the positives of family care. Um, so globally, it's estimated, but we really have no way of knowing because most countries don't count the children in orphanages accurately or at all. That So estimated five to eight million children live in orphanages globally, but that 80% of them, and sometimes as high as four out of five, have living family members. And so there's been a real disconnect over the last 20, 30 years around what is an orphan, what is a child in an orphanage. And unfortunately, most of children in orphanages are there due to family poverty or a crisis, um, not actually because of being orphaned. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I just want to talk briefly on the limitations then of placing a child as a first resort in an orphanage. Um, there's been a lot of global research that's come out in the last 10 to 15 years. And what the global research says is that there's a very negative impact on childhood development when a child is raised with what we call congregate care, which is children in a large group with paid caregivers that circulate on shifts particularly. Um, and so some of the results coming out are seeing um, extremely high levels after aging out of the, the orphanage of suicide, of homelessness, of joblessness, of struggles in parenting and in marriage. Um, and so one of the reasons for that is because child development and a successful transition into adulthood is very dependent on creating secure attachments when you're young. And I, you probably all know this with kids or grandkids, nieces and nephews. Um, when you are a child, you need your needs met over and over and over again, carefully, lovingly, and regularly. And you, it's not just physical needs, right? It's love, it's emotion, it's eye contact to your baby, it's talking. Um, children in orphanages tend to be severely behind on their development um, in terms of language development, social skills, cognitive development. It can be very damaging to live in um, a group of other children. And you can go to the next slide. So interestingly, a study has Oh, no, go back up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. A few studies have been done that have some like evidence, right, which is always important because we don't want to just make up. We think this is not good. We think there's impacts on child development. Um, one of the studies was recently done by um, a faith based group in Zambia called ACE and ACE looked at children living in um, place back into foster families or their families of origin with support. Um, and those living with um, like a very excellent level of what you'd call residential care. So they were given um, high levels of needs being met, all their health, nutrition, um, education needs all met in the residential care. So we it wasn't a comparison of very poor uh, orphanage or residential care to family care. It was all the needs are being met except that family connection. And what they saw as they as they followed the outcomes is there was such an impact on the children's gross motor skills were so much better uh, living in a family. Their fine motor skills were so much more developed. Their language was so much more developed. And their social emotional abilities were so much more developed. You can go to the next slide. We can 
look back at a research study that was done in Romania called the Bucharest Early Intervention Report. And this was done, um, I suppose it was about 16 to 18 years ago now. It was, this was my aha light bulb moment is um, a group of researchers went into Romanian orphanages as communism had come to an end and we all became aware that children were being housed institutionally by the thousands. And they decided to look at actual brain studies of child development. And so mm -hmm. they placed children in foster families. Um, the average age, I believe, was around three. And they looked at um, the brain when they were placed and over time. And they also kept track of brain scans of children that were not able to be placed into foster families. Um, and you can see here that the brain on the right was the brain of the children who were kept in institutional care. It's not very lit up. Um, and the brain on the left uh, is the lit up areas of the children that had been placed with families. Um, the brains were able to recover and the brains healed at, and it was around age three. There are some like, um, some people are believe all brains can heal at any time. Some people believe it's better to heal them very, very early, but this is around age three. And so um, it was interesting to see this and it was the first scientific available evidence um, of some of the actual brain outcomes of family care. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so in Haiti and in all of the rest of the world, there are both push factors and pull factors that cause children to be placed in institutions. We call, let's, what I commonly say is institutions, residential care, or orphanages, and I use them all the same way. But if I'm going to refer to a residential care where it's short term or it has a therapeutic or family type benefit, I'll, I'll say that specifically. Um, so when we're talking about the push and pull factors, some families experience a lot of push factors, and this is why they place their children outside of the home. The number one reason globally is poverty. They can't afford to feed their children, right? And if you can't afford to feed your children, you can't afford to put them in a uniform and send them to school. And if you're unemployed, you definitely can't afford to put them in uniform and send them to school and feed them. And if a natural disaster strikes, um, you may also have extreme health care costs in there, right? If somebody was hurt or if your house collapsed, you may not even have a safe place to house your family. Um, a death of one or both parents, globally, the death of a father has a massive impact on the ability of a family to function and often slides them right into poverty. Um, domestic violence and abuse. That's why we say our mission is, you know, our vision is to see children in thriving families. Not any family is a healthy family. So we're certainly not advocating that all children um, be placed into unhealthy or violent families. Um, but violence and abuse can be a factor for placement of children in an orphanage or separation of a family. And then physical or emotional disability. This is a huge one. Families who are unable to afford medication or access therapy or access healthcare, and you know this is a huge problem in Haiti. You combine that with stigma in the community around um, disability, and what happens is then families flip over, see that pull factor, and they begin to view the orphanage as having a lot of benefits. So if you are experiencing those factors under the push, you begin to look at the orphanage down the street and think, yeah, that has a lot of perceived benefits. It might be advertising that it has medical care or food, um, it might actually offer a school on the campus. Um, sometimes it has rehab for disabilities. Uh, the I will say the problem is um, perceived benefits of an orphanage in the body of evidence around this, unfortunately, it doesn't outweigh the negatives of being separated from family because of some of the things I've outlined for you about social, emotional development, cognitive development, all of that. Um, and so it can be very dangerous to be a victim of any of these factors and, and have them exist in your community while at the same time an orphanage or, or an institution is calling. Come, we'll take your child. Doesn't mean they're going to take you with your child. It doesn't mean they might, they might not give you back your child. They may not keep your ties to your child. And we see this a lot, unfortunately, in Haiti. And I will talk a bit more about that um, in another slide. You can go down one. I'm going to go up one for just a minute. Oh, sure. man, somebody, had, somebody had a question and wanted to know that the one brain was referred to as abused. Yep. I wonder if you could address that, why it was called abused brain. Sure. I So I can't read it right here, but these uh, are the brain scans that were included in the Bucharest Early Intervention Report, but there are dozens of brain scans to look at. And so 
my understanding of this is it's considered abuse to have a child um, in an institution. And when this was done in Romania, you have to consider that those huge institutions were very much in an abusement, abusive place for children. So back when the movement started towards family care and care reform, it began in Eastern Europe. It began with, you know, the end of communism and looking at the children in these orphanages in Romania. And they were children who were adult, you know, adult age living in cribs, still the size of infants. And so it was very much considered abusive to be in an institution in Eastern Europe. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so what does family-based care mean, right? I, I think this has been a struggle for a lot of people when they think about family care. It means many different things. It does not mean that if you run an orphanage, that tomorrow you're going to um, gather up all your children in the orphanage and tell them, go find your families wherever they're from, good luck with that. And you're gonna close down your orphanage center. That is not what it means. So family care in any country means um, you're going to prioritize strengthening families. You're gonna preserve families where they exist, strengthen them so that they are a thriving family, and you're gonna prevent family separation. You're gonna prevent kids being at risk of ever having to leave their family or enter an orphanage. Number two, family care is you're going to increase alternative family care options. So this can be something that an organization promotes. This can be that, for example, an, uh, a church has raised up foster families and trained them very well through their local church. And you are then increasing alternative options and that is family care because those children who aren't strengthened and aren't preserved and do need another option could go into foster families. And that's an alternative family care option. Another way, of, another idea behind family care is you're empowering communities by increasing economic opportunity and educational opportunities. Because when the entire community is stronger and better able to overcome poverty and other obstacles, um, they will often um, self-preserve their children in families, right? And so there won't be as many push factors towards uh, family breakdown and children entering orphanages. You can go to the next one. I've taken some of these slides from a great group that I think you're going to love called the Faith to Action Initiative. And um, they track, they do a lot of research on strategies that make a difference for family care. And I would bet some of you are twinned already with organizations, communities, or churches that provide some of these strategies. So these are just some that make a real difference in preserving families, providing alternate care, or building up communities. And I'll talk about some of them very specifically next. You can go ahead. Um, so the first one is income generation. If poverty is the global number one factor that kids are in orphanages and it's not orphaning, then what, it's really critical to improve families' ability to make an income and feed their children and pay for their children's school books and uniforms and um, keep their families home, right? And so that can look like micro loans. Uh, it can look like teaching a women um, certain crafts to sell. It can look like saving credit organizations. Globally, again, research shows that when you improve a mother's ability to bring income into the family, children are much more likely to remain in the family. We'll go to the next one. Education support. Education globally is a massive problem. It is a huge factor for children entering orphanage or institutional care because families want their children to access education. And yet around the world, education is not free, even in countries that say it's free. In Haiti, you probably all know you have to be able to buy a uniform and school shoes and books and supplies. Uh, then, you know, you have to get their kid to the, the school. And what if you're in a rural area that has no access? And so when you can provide any type of support around a family and a child accessing education that is not placing them in an orphanage with, an, with a school building in the orphanage, if you can help them access community education, that is such a huge piece of preserving families. And then through education, you can hire social workers that can help families work on problems that they might need to work on to become a thriving family. You can provide disability um, therapies and supports through your school or through one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one, um, treatments in family homes of the children that attend. You can have a feeding program that overcomes so much of the, the issues around feeding and hunger that drive children into orphanages. Um, when you have a school, you can do so much, right? You can reach so many people in the community and that builds up the entire community. 
So I love seeing education used as a way of family preservation. And then supporting local churches. I hope that's why I'm on here. Um, local churches are an amazing point-to-point -point contact for raising awareness and supporting families. The local church, you probably know here in the U.S., in most countries, it's often the number one place families go when they're in crisis. It's where they look for their village. It's where they look for pastoral support. Um, if a church is giving the message of, we will help you with your crisis, we will help you with your children, um, that is often just such a protective factor that preserves families. Um, and in Haiti, sometimes, unfortunately, we see churches turn into orphanages when really a church could uh, meet the needs of so many families in the community by providing different types of services. They could even be a daycare center during the day, um, but not take children away from families. And so supporting local churches and having church partnerships is a really, really strong tool. All right, go ahead. Oh boy. Okay. A little bit more boring. Hopefully you'll stick with me. Global care reform. Um, if you haven't heard of this before, there is a big movement going on globally. Um, and what it is, is the idea that systems need to be transformed in countries in a way that supports families. And so there are some characteristics of what we call glo uh, global care reform. And those characteristics are that the government in partnership with what we say NGOs, non-governmental organizations, that could include some of your partner churches, um, are moving away from placing children in residential care orphanages as their first resort. You find a baby, it's abandoned in a hospital. Global care reform commitment says you're going to look for a family for that child, a temporary foster family, while you search for a more permanent place. You're not taking that baby to an orphanage because babies don't do well in orphanages. And so it's a commitment towards reorienting, reorienting policies and practice to family. Um, it transforms whole systems. It Global care reform, care reform in a country has to include the healthcare system, the education system, the social welfare system, um, has to have government commitment, church commitment, community commitment. It's quite a big effort. Um, it often starts just the beginning of care reform is engagement. So it's, um, for example, it's an international organization. I used to work for one coming in at the invitation of a government and starting to train them. What, why is family care important? What are your systems now? What could they look like differently? Where, how much money does it cost for your, to place a child in each orphanage? How much might it cost to place them in foster care? And then it's starting to engage with communities and churches and organizations. And that's like the goal of the network, right? Is to have that engagement piece so that everyone is moving towards a common agenda of the importance of families. And that is what care reform is. I'll talk a bit about examples in a bit. Go ahead. This is a cute um, graphic of care reform. So I like to keep this graphic in mind because it really gives you more of an idea of what it looks like. So you have the child at the center and that child is in community or living with their parents or aunts and uncles or grandparents or adoptive parents. You could add in here like foster family, um, community members, that you want all of that strengthened by policies and activities that strengthen their core people. And then it goes out. The next one is their teachers, their neighbors, their church. The next is businesses, non-governmental organizations, the media, the police. In Haiti, it would be like BPM, um, Bureau of Protection of Minors, making sure that they're prioritizing um, preserving families instead of removing children or if they're removing them, placing them in an alternate that is not a permanent orphanage. And then the last one is government, right? It's that number four circle. It's the laws, the policies, the funding, the donors, the international donors, the welfare system, all are making changes. Care reform is not easy. It is not simple. It goes on for years and years and years. Um, but you, it's really important to start somewhere. Um, and so Haiti's already started somewhere. I'll talk about that in a minute. Go ahead. Okay, if you're still, if we're still talking globally, in 1990, many of you might know there was the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it uh, set out children's rights as having the right to identity, um, the right to their family, the right to their language, the right to their culture. Um, the U.S. did not ratify this, <laughs> uh, but most of the rest of the world did, and so it was the most widely adopted international human rights treaty in history. And 20 years later, on the anniversary of it, 
um, the Guidelines for Alternative Care of Children was produced by the UN. And so those guidelines were really set out what does it look like to say children have a right to a family? Or what does it mean that children have a right to language or their community? Um, and so there is a very interesting document and I've, I've put a picture of it here. Um, it's called Moving Forward, Implementing the Guidelines for the Alternative Care of Children. It's the easy read version of these 2009 guidelines. And it talks about in what scenarios would you move a child into, into an orphanage or residential care? In what scenarios would, would you not? How would you make that assessment? Um, yeah, what does it look like to have rights to your culture, language, and community? What kind of activities should be prioritized around that? It's really excellent for organizations that intersect with children or youth or families to have read these guidelines. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then came 2019, um, for many years leading up to 2019, about 255 organizations came together. I've never seen such a collective movement of international groups committed to ensuring that the General Assembly would write into um, the rights of the child that uh, children have a right to not be raised in institutional care. And so um, there were members of the disability community that um, were included in this because Globally, many adults and children with disabilities are institutionalized. Um, and it demanded that there be more investment in child protection and social services and family care in communities. It also um, included the statement that uh, governments must do better in collecting data and numbers around how many children are in the institutions in their country, because they're often the kids are not counted. If you don't know how many kids are in uh, institutional care, residential care, orphanages across your country. How do you know what condition they are in? How do you know what's happening with them? How do you assess them? How do you build up a family welfare system for them? Um, so this was a big move in 2019 and it got a little bit overlooked because then COVID came. <laughs> uh, but it was a very exciting moment for those of us work, that work with children, youth and families around the world um, because it really focused on the importance of family um, and didn't just say children, yeah, children have a right to family, but children have a right not to be separated from their family. Um, they have a right to preserve families for systems to work with families for alternative family options for permanency and love. And like this just wasn't originally in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Next slide. I just thought I'd give you uh, like a place to start, right? Um, so the first document is called, <laughs> I can't read it because it's not zoomed in. I think it's uh, called Rethinking Orphan Care. <laughs> um, let me see if I can zoom in on it, but I can't find that function here. Hmm. I think I know what they're all called. All right, I think we're good. Um, okay. These are all on their website, by the way. So we'll, yeah. we'll give you that address and you can look them up. Absolutely. Um, so Rethinking Orphan Care is one of the uh, publications on the Faith to Action Initiative website. And so Rethinking Orphan Care is a really helpful place to start if you have a church partnership with a group implementing any kind of orphan care. Um, it's just an, a really good faith-based place to start, right? And the next one is called Changing the Way We Care Guatemala. Yes, and it goes with the one that's just called Changing the Way We Care, a study of child care reform in Latin America and the Caribbean. So those two middle ones are very focused on um, what was called, what is called Changing the Way We Care. And this is um, a program that came out of the MacArthur Foundation giving a giant grant um, back in, I think it was also 2019, 2018, 19, um, to several groups. Uh, it was called 100 million and change. So if you could think of something you could change in the world um, and you won this award, you would get $100 million to implement it. And Changing the Way We Care was a kind of a group project, right? CRS, Catholic Relief Services, led it, and they got second place. It was so exciting. And so they, uh, Changing the Way We Care has implemented pilots in Guatemala, Moldova. Um, they have a couple of different ones, uh, Kenya, and then Haiti received some of the funding and some of the pilots. And so I'll talk about that in a minute. But Changing the Way We Care is where you want you're gonna find like your Catholic resources, which I think might be beneficial to this group. And then the final resource over there is called Better Care Network. This is um, their newsletter from 2019 um, when 
the um, the kind of the new UN resolution came out. But Better Care Network produces a newsletter about every quarter, and they're on a lot of amazing family care topics. They also have a website. You can just go to www.bettercarenetwork.org. You can type into their search bar anything. You could type in Haiti Family Care, and you'll get a bunch of resources that come up. It's an excellent tool. Go to the next one. Um, it's my understanding that several of you or some of you might work more broadly and not just in Haiti. You might work in the what we call LAC, Latin America Caribbean region. And so I thought I'd touch on a few resources um, and what's been happening in the Latin America Caribbean region. Well before Haiti and the Haitian government made any commitment to care reform, um, care reform was happening in Latin America. And it was led by many different groups, but one really interesting key one is called RELAF, R-E-L-A-F. And if you go to RELAF's website, you'll see that they are considered sort of the, the leaders in promoting family care and best practice and resources throughout the entire LAC region. RELAF holds um, annual conferences that you might wanna attend or send your partners to. Um, RELAF has a lot of documents in many different languages that are extremely helpful. They um, promote foster care throughout the region and sort of how do you do foster care in this region? What does that look like? They work with governments, um, they work with faith-based groups, churches, NGOs. There are also a lot of networks. Um, some of you might recognize Red Latino Americana. Uh, it's a network for foster families. Um, there is Lumos that works in Colombia and Panama. Uh, UNICEF LACRO, that's the United Nations Children's Fund. LACRO is their LAC regional office. They lead a lot of different publications and research throughout the region on family care. They also offer a lot of funding around family care in the region. Uh, Casa Viva is a really interesting example of um, a group that started out of a church in Costa Rica, I wanna say about 25 years ago now, and now they are a leader in training social workers and foster care um, families and churches throughout the entire region, especially on uh, training churches on how to develop foster care programming and how to strengthen families. Um, I love Casa Viva, and if you're in that Central America region, they're a really great resource. Um, then there's PANI, SOS Children's Villages. There's the LAC Care Leavers Network. So there's a network of children that aged out of orphanage care, and they have a lot to say about family care and their experiences. And then there's Doncel in Argentina, which is also a network. Um, so no matter where you're at in the Latin American region, um, I hope that you'll be able to plug into one of these networks for whether it's resources or attending a conference or sending your partner church there. There is a document right here called Beyond Institutional Care. It is the sort of preeminent roadmap on how to implement care reform throughout the region, throughout Latin America and Caribbean. I know when we when I say that, it sounds kind of ridiculous because every country is different and every scenario is different and your experience is different. And your church has a different problem. And But if you're just thinking, what does this look like from an overarching view? What does it cost for a country or an organization to do this? Who do you talk to first? How do you get plugged in? What is What are some strategies? It's a great document to read. Um, and in LAC, the commitment for care reform in the region is strengthen the family and prevent the unnecessary separation of the child from his or her family environment, the deinstitutionalization process of like reunifying children, with their families and strengthening alternative family care. So foster families, kinship, extended families, community care, even um, offering options like small group homes. I don't count those out. And I do want to give a caveat that in every country and in every situation, there will still be a need for some small group homes that are family-like, that often provide a therapeutic reason for their existence. Um, in Colombia, for example, the government oversees all, all care of children and a lot of their homes and a lot of their, um, what we might look at as orphanages, but are actually what residential therapeutic care are for children that are um, drug addicted, street children. Um, but because they're part of a care reform movement, the, each child is assessed individually and each goal is to get them out of there at some point and into family. Whatever family means for that child's goals, that is always the goal. So that is always what you want to be thinking. Even the use of residential care is can be okay temporarily and in circumstances, but the goal is seeing every child thrive in a family. So never, it's good to never stop at we provide a, a residential facility. It's always good to be thinking, what do children need long-term? All right, and in Haiti, 
I bet you guys could give this. Um, in 2010 was the earthquake. And after that, the number of orphanages increased tenfold. So there was just a shocking build of orphanages. Um, a study in, say it's 2018, 2017, 18 came out um, showing that $100 million a year comes from U.S. churches into these orphanages. So it's a significant financial commitment to um, keep what the government revealed in 2012 are 32,000 children in orphanage care. Haiti is the size of the state of Maryland, um, and 32,000 children are in orphanages in, the, in a country the size of Maryland. Guatemala is the size of Tennessee, and it has 3,500 children in orphanage care, and that's considered very poor. Like, that's not a good number. Globally, Guatemala is a country that um, a lot of investment is being put into to bring around care reform. So it's very interesting if you actually compare the physical size and the numbers of children. Um, what it reveals is there's a there's a crisis in Haiti, right? But it's not necessarily a crisis of children having you know lost both parents. In 2016, um, Lumos Foundation and IBSR, who some of you are familiar with, probably maybe, it's the arm of the Ministry of Social Affairs responsible for orphanages. They did some investigation and they revealed that, um, unfortunately, in Haiti, as in some countries, not all countries, but in Haiti, there um, has been a use of orphanages as a business development program for the orphanage director. And so there was the kind of the reveal of a report about this with several examples of unscrupulous business director, pastor, orphanage directors uh, recruiting children from the community into their orphanages. And... Um, than seeking funding from U.S. church partners. Uh, so this was kind of a shocking report that came out, and we'd be happy to share that. It's not all orphanages, not all residential care, but certainly it was a shock to some people who um, have church partnerships. And then in 2018, um, a two-year-long analysis was done, and it was revealed in 2018 that only 15% of orphanages across Haiti are actually registered. And so there are a lot of children unaccounted for in Haiti um, with, no, with no real oversight. Um, and that 25,000 children at least are still in these orphanages, and the majority of the orphanages were assessed as red. So they have a dangerous level of child abuse or neglect taking place. Um, and so it's very concerning for those children. The government has made commitments since about 2014. I believe that's when the foster care framework was produced. So the government of Haiti created a foster care framework. They are committed to foster care being developed as an alternative care solution for children. They placed a moratorium on the opening of new orphanages a few years ago. They made a, um, a statement, a public statement, and they have a, like a written strategy prioritizing family care and alternative care for children. They participated um, in a three-day training um, for the government. This was in um, spring of 2019 on uh, creating a roadmap, a plan for how to shift some of uh, the child care situation in Haiti towards family care. What would that look like? What ministries need to be involved? Where would the funding be found? Unfortunately, then COVID hit and the country completely destabilized. And so there have been some pilots, specifically of Catholic programs, in the South Department through Catholic Relief Services and Changing We Care that are focused on um, foster care, on um, working directly with orphanages run by Catholic sisters who have been there their entire life and working directly with them about what would it look like to open up the doors more to the community and seek alternative families for the kids. So they've had some success, but because of the political situation, as you all know, it's been very hard to document successes right now in Haiti. But what we do know as a network from people telling us and from our own leadership organizations still being operational in Haiti is that Social workers are still on the ground. Children, youth, and families still need family. Um, things are, everyone still needs health care. Um, orphanages are uh, sometimes a very dangerous place behind walls. They can be targeted by gangs. And so there are new problems. There are existing problems. There will always be probably problems. Um, and yet I, people like you continue to commit to Haiti and to the, the church partnerships that you have. And I find that really impressive. We can go to the last slide, which is just um, how to find our website, HaitiFamilyCareNetwork.org, my two email addresses, and then just a couple of um, websites that I mentioned here, Faith to Action, um, Changing the Way We Care, and the middle one is CAFO. If you're not familiar, 
CAFO stands for the Christian Alliance for Orphans, and they produce a huge conference every year. This one's in Nashville in September. Really encourage you to come if, if your work um, intersects with churches that work with children in other countries. That's what the entire conference is about. You will find a track for you that interests you, whether it's on how to better engage your, your parish partner, how to better engage your donors, um, what kind of messaging works, what doesn't, what does family care look like. There's an entire day that I'll be part of that's called a simulation lab, where groups come and we walk through all the different steps of what it would look like to expand your model of care from an orphanage to reach the families of the children in the orphanage. Um, so there are just many resources out there. And um, I really encourage you that if this interests you to get out there and read some of them and, and send me an email if you have any questions. Amanda, thanks so much. And I wanna encourage everybody uh, very strongly to visit the HaitiFamilyCareNetwork.org. The, the the amount of materials they have there is just astounding. And in fact, that's how I became first acquainted with them. I had a yeah. parish that called me and said, David, we were down in Haiti last and we experienced a pretty severe uh, case of child abuse. We witnessed it. What, what do we, we, we were all dumbfounded, didn't know what we were supposed to do. What are our obligations? We know what they are in the US, but what do we do? So I said, you know what? I don't even know. So let me do some research. And I found there's actually a protocol and a document in Haiti on what you're supposed to do. So those kinds of things that there's there's a huge intersection with the work we do and the things that we encounter while we're there. So um, there will be a link to that. We I don't think it's there yet, but in our web portal, our own PTPA web portal will link to that. So you can access those resources via that way too. But you can just directly look through your website. So I want to open up for questions. We got a few minutes and I imagine there's some brewing questions. <laughs> I'm kind of scared. <laughs> I, sometimes this this workshop is the first time people have thought about some of this. And so feel free to say or ask whatever you want. It's okay. Well, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Mission Circle Inc. is my group, and we have Sister Parish in Honduras, Haiti. Uh, Haiti is actually four schools and Cuba. And you didn't mention Cuba directly, although they're in the Caribbean. Do you know anything about the situation in Cuba? You know, I really don't. And the Caribbean has been so left out of the lack regional conversation that it's incredibly disappointing. Um, I don't know anything about what's happening in Cuba. And it's one of the reasons we're trying to advocate for Haiti to have a higher profile in the LAC region, just so people know what's happening in Haiti. But I apologize, I don't know. Um, you know what? Go to the bettercarenetwork.org uh, website, type in Cuba in their search bar, and let's you can see um, if anything comes up there. That's your best bet to know what's happening in Cuba for any of this. Thank you. Anybody else? Does anyone feel like offended? <laughs> I uh, used to give this work quite a lot and people sometimes feel offended and that's okay too. Yeah, Linda, you had a question. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, first of all, is it possible to have access to your presentation for the websites? And yeah, I think what I'm going to do is just, I need to take out speaker notes. I had a few speaker notes in there and mm -hmm. a couple of the slides are borrowed from another group. So I just need to toss their, um, their logo on those slides. So David, I'll do that and then send it back to you. Yeah. I'll be sharing the recording of this. And with that, I'll send a link to, to the presentation as well. So yeah. Perfect. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. yeah um, what, one other question. Um, the rest of the system in Haiti, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you're aware, you know, familiar with it. And um, basically, where it's where families um, give their children to other families with the expectations that the, the, uh, the families that accept them will educate them, um, and give them opportunity, which, you know, more times than not does not happen. And the, and the kids are, are virtually slaves in their in these people's homes. Um, and I'm wondering if if you're if the network is involved in um, addressing that mm -hmm. or alleviating the, the 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 needs of or mitigating the needs of the of the children that are affected in those situations. 
Yeah. So we, when we talk about families being separated or children at risk of separation from their family, we mean children at risk of going into rest of X situations as well. Um, mm-hmm. Because certainly those children are extremely vulnerable, just as vulnerable as kids on the street, as kids, um, you know, placed for a lifetime in an orphanage. It's a very vulnerable situation. Um, we have a member organization called Respire Haiti, R-E-S-P-I-R-E. Mm-hmm. And they're, they are a school, they operate a school, but it grew out of the, un, of seeing the rest of X situation. And they have a lot of rest of X in their school. And so I think uh, we have... So we know of organizations working directly on the rest of X situation as a network. I think we just approach the entire topic of children at risk of family separation and that fall, a lot of types of children fall under right. that category. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to mention that Amanda mentioned social work as a solution and social educated social workers in Haiti uh, being helpful. And it was something I hadn't thought about. And I have a master's social work degree and I've been to Haiti many times. And I thought, wow, to think about in our schools and most of us operate a school, how much if we, in the absence of a social worker, we know there's incredible social and family problems that the, those problems fall to the, to the pastor often or to the principal and they're not always equipped and so I'm just a little plug for Josh Anderson, who is on our call tonight. Josh and his wife are going to present in September at our Zoom September or S- September Zoom meeting on a social work education. Um, it's a university in Haiti. It's an online university. They're going to talk about that. So we have a, a way to yeah. perhaps sponsor uh, somebody to go and get their social work degree. We can therefore then hire them to, to work at our school within our parish and provide a whole different level of support. These are people that are trained in Haitian law and, and, and all of these principles that Amanda talked about or that are outlined by the department there. So uh, mm-hmm. stay tuned for that uh, in September. Yeah, I always say when people ask this, you know, if people say this feels overwhelming, what are we going to do? Um, what is your next step? What is your one next step? You don't have to take all the steps. You don't have to be the government. You don't have to implement care reform. Your one next step, I always say, hire a good social worker or hire more social workers, train your social workers. Um, Social workers are the best answer, I think, to helping families um, really survive, thrive, overcome obstacles. Somebody put in a question, do you work with the deaf community? It says deaf, but I bet it's the deaf community. I hope it's the deaf community. <laughs> yeah, we don't really work with the dead. Too I hope so. Um, no, I don't specifically, and I don't, none of our members do, but if you wrote to the contact inbox I told you about, um, that'll come to me and I can forward that out to our group and see if anyone does work with the deaf community. It's a benefit of a network, right? We can just ask. <laughs> well, and they fall into those category of folks with a, with a disability, if you will, in there. We know that that children with disabilities are a struggle, certainly in the U.S., but boy, in a country like Haiti, they're they're often shunned and and yeah. it's uh, incredibly challenging for them to grow up. So, great. Well, Amanda, thanks so much. This has been really educational and helpful, I think, for all of us. I mean, you know, we're most of us run schools or we're involved in in some way in family life in Haiti because we get, when we get involved with the parish, we get involved with the, with the people there. And for us to be aware of the resources that are available and and kind yeah. of the, this movement is really helpful. And I'm aware that many of our parishes um, somehow support or involved with an orphanage in Haiti. And perhaps we can learn something new and be a part of the solution as well. So it's been really helpful. Thanks so much. I'm so glad. Everyone feel free. Any Anyone can reach out to me. I'll do my best to support you with resources or point you to the right people. And I look forward, I hope to see some of you on some of our workshops in the future. If you want to sign up for our newsletter, we it doesn't go out very often. We don't send very many emails, but you just get an alert if we have an online workshop coming up. And I'd love to see some of you there if you want to be there. And I'll be inviting Amanda, maybe I already did, to our national conference, which just as a reminder will be August of 2025, so a little more than a year from now, be in Nashville, Tennessee on the August 13th. How did I guess that it would also be in Nashville? <laughs> Should Isn't I just crazy? Nashville. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. So uh, Amanda <laughs> will be there and, and be doing a presentation on this as well, I'm sure. So looking forward Thank to it. You. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. God bless. If there's anything you need from me, um, only a phone call or a 
email away. I'm glad, glad to help. Everybody Thanks have a great night. Bye. God bless. Bye-bye.